Exactly how accurately did I fly the 5,000 kilometer border? How much fuel did I use? How much did this whole trip cost? What were the highs? What were the lows? The good points, the bad points? I put it out on Instagram and asked you what questions you would like to know and wow, what a response. I didn't realize you'd be so interested in this trip. So thank you so much for all the questions. I'm gonna try answering as many of your questions as I can. And at the same time, let's go through the GPS track as an overlay so we can see just how accurately I did fly the border. Now, if you haven't watched the previous videos, then spoilers are gonna be ahead. So maybe click on the link down below in the description to watch episodes one, two, and three. If you have already watched those, thank you very much. I do appreciate the support. And let's start at the start pretty uneventful takeoff as you would have seen on the videos around the coastline I was worried about controlled airspace in the end controlled airspace wasn't really a problem at all as we flew around this first part of the bay came through Avalon back out of their airspace around here at Port Arlington and that's when we started to make our way down the coast now the first question that leads me to was from duck quacking who said what did you do for flight notification and SAR time well I did actually file a flight plan for each of the flights I did obviously I couldn't put in every single GPS waypoint around the coast but I put in the remarks tracing the outline of the border of Victoria so if anyone from air traffic control was looking and wondering what I was doing why I was flying like this at least in the remarks they knew what the objective of the flight was came down the coastline here to Cape Otway and you can see look this part I didn't really include very much in, in the videos I put out when you zoom in a little bit more what you can see you can see the sort of style of flying I was doing I was really picking a headland here picking a headland here and when it was a small bay I was quite often just flying across I wasn't being accurate enough going across here on the larger bays you can see my track was more curved coming out to the headland at this point down here at lawn but generally I felt like I was kind of hopping from headland to headland more than trying to accurately go in and out of the coastline if you zoom out it looks pretty good so maybe I'll maybe I'll zoom out maybe I won't zoom in very much it looks better this part, I'll be honest, it wasn't too difficult. It's all like, keep the sea on your left, keep the land on your right, nice relatively easy start. But it was only easy for a short period of time because the next question, yeah, from SQ My Photography, what was the most stressful part of the process? Well, actually the most stressful part and probably the hardest bit of flying I did on the whole trip came on that very first day, which was when we got here to Portland. And if you remember from the videos, this is when we had really low cloud. I think the cloud would have been about 1100, 1200 feet above ground level at some point. So I was ducking down underneath it at around 800 feet, low down over the water. It's not a place that I like to be in a plane, but in terms of the most stressful part, well, we can just measure this here. It doesn't look too long, but from this headland to this one, I mean, that's still 15 and a half kilometers, so nine miles. So probably three or four minutes worth of flying in between these two headlands over the water, low level. And if anything happened with the engine over water at that point, it was, it's gonna be a, a ditching for, for sure. Lake Bong Bong, oh, I didn't see that before, it's a cool name. Then this was the turn inland to do that big straight line which you would have seen in the series. I'll just measure this again because I'm actually, looking back at it, I'm fairly happy with this. 500, say half a kilometer offline. Now this was all done without GPS, this was just done with timings. I knew that this town of Nelson here, um, I had about a minute of flying before I had to turn right. And to only be a half a kilometer out just by doing that visually, I was actually pretty happy with that. And that leads me to the next question from Slidesdales underscore Mac, which was what was the biggest thing you may have overlooked about taking this on? I'm doing all this navigating manually using the old techniques. And I think the biggest thing I overlooked was that I've forgotten a lot of that by flying with GPS and, and all the tech in the plane all the time. And you can see with my drift correction, I was quite a long way off the line at some points. In fact, the biggest deviation, couple of kilometers there, yeah, almost three kilometers off where I should have been. But here we go, this is where I needed to turn back uh, to the east and start tracking down the Murray River. And I didn't actually show this in the original video, but this is where I needed to turn. And this is where I actually did turn. So this was actually quite a bit of a navigation mistake. I just turned too early, 6.9 kilometers too early. I was visually trying to spot the river and I think I saw the river here and I mistook that for this part of the river here because it's just so bendy and there's nothing else really on the ground to identify it. So I just turned too early. I was hoping to turn, because this would have been fun, I was hoping to turn from Victoria uh, into South Australia into New South Wales and back into Victoria again. But as it turns out, I was just in Victoria all the time. 
down the Murray River all the way to our first stop at the end of the day, which was, of course, Mildura. Hector Courtney asked, do you have any regrets from the trip? No regrets from an aviation point of view, but one little regret from a filmmaking point of view, and that's that I don't think I did enough filming in the places I stopped at when I was on the ground. I think there's a lot of things that I can still learn about making better content for YouTube uh, when I'm exploring the places that I'm visiting. But you know what they say, a good pilot is always learning, and that's where the sponsors of today's video, Skillshare, can also help you. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people just like you. Explore new skills, develop existing interests, and get lost in your own creativity. And Skillshare have very kindly sponsored this video, which helps me achieve my travel, aviation, and filmmaking goals. But what about your goals? Well, depending on what those goals are, Skillshare probably has a course for you. From commercial pilots who can take you right through the process of how to fly for the airlines, all the way through to learning new creative skills that you can use in your YouTube videos or your Instagram account by creators who I really like, like Christopher Rhodes, who I'm a big fan of here on YouTube. Plus, if like me, you're a traveler who loves their technology, there are courses on drone photography, iPhone travel photography, and loads, loads more to keep you learning and keep you being creative. Plus, the first thousand people to click on the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership, which then just goes to around $10 per month after that point. I'm very grateful to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Thank you very much for making it possible for me to make content like this. Now, we're leaving Mildura, and this is where my track starts to get, well, this is where it really starts to fall apart. Took off from Mildura to the south then, made a left turn, and already you can see what I've done here is by taking off to the south and having come in, uh, I think it was runway 09 the day before, all of this part of the Murray River I've completely missed. Down the river, this was beautiful. This was a really nice, calm, clear morning. Really just enjoying flying low level 2500, following the Murray River. I was following the Loddon River for a while there as opposed to the Murray River. I think I said in the video I forgot that Australia has more than one river and everything was pretty straightforward for our first landing then of the day and the refueling stop at Ichuka. That only took about 20 minutes but then here you go this was Ichuka this is after I took off and this was the part where I made my big actually I'm just going to jump into Google Maps instead I probably should have used this from the start. The satellite image on here is a lot better. This was the area that I was avoiding. And if we just zoom in a little bit more, you can see it's, it's that's just woods. And you don't want to be flying low level in an aircraft over that. Well, to be honest, I didn't. I, I made the conscious decision not to. So yes, I could have followed the Murray River on this dotted line around here, but instead I made a conscious decision to avoid that. This was the point that I was just chatting to you, I think about don't be a hero and to fly on a nice weather day. And then I completely missed out the river at this point. And here, this is the town, yeah, this is the town of Howlong, which is a VFR reporting point for Albury, because this is when we were going to go into controlled airspace. Now, the reason there's this big S turn that you can see around here is because at this point I was at five and a half thousand feet and they wanted me at three and a half to go through controlled airspace. I just did a quick S turn to descend down to 3,500. Robol Cesar said, how did ATC let you do this? I asked them and they said yes. I will be honest, with Avalon and Albury that were about to fly through, I did send them both an email beforehand just letting them know what I was doing so they had my plans already. But when you're on the radio, you confidently say what you want to do and the awesome people in air traffic control said yes. So this was great. This was fun actually flying three and a half thousand feet through Albury and then down the lakes. I mean, there was a bit going on. There was other traffic. I was just making sure I was in the right place, but flying along these lakes, I think I said it in the video was just beautiful. The closest I've actually flown my aircraft to Mount Kosciuszko. And this was where I was supposed to make my turn, which again, I covered in the videos, but we can just have another look here. It's about, yeah, four, four kilometers too early. Now I've talked about the deviations here. The one thing I didn't show you in the original videos was this part. This was where I was dealing with all of this low cloud. If you'll remember, there was a low overcast layer that I was above at the time. I saw a gap over Malakuta, so I made a quick right turn and ducked under the clouds at that point. But it did mean, and I never showed you this on the original video, it did mean ugh, that we were, well, let's be honest, it's about 20 kilometers away from where I should have been. So I turned 20 kilometers too early. I would have loved to have got this track all the way down here, but weather deviations, they're part of aviation. I don't regret doing that. It just, 
it just looks a bit ugly cutting the corner off in that way. But anyway, along this beautiful coastline and of course into Bairnsdale to end the second day. Askoot, thank you very much for asking how was my stay in Bairnsdale. I had a lovely stay, thank you. I had a very nice vegan pizza at the Earth and Soul Pizzeria. Oh, and the airport was fantastic. Really secure airport for overnight parking. If you haven't been to Bairnsdale and you fly around the same areas that I do, check it out. Then on the final day, took off from Bairnsdale again, flew out to the coast. I'm a little bit disappointed in myself that I didn't actually connect the two points where I flew into Bensdale and out again on the coast, so I did miss out a little bit. Now these islands that you would have seen, I made that decision to fly closer to land than out to sea. I'm still happy with that decision. When you zoom out a little bit, it does kind of make it look like I've really cut out a big part of the land, but a lot of these are islands, that's my justification, and actually the mainland border would be somewhere along there. But then around the bay here of Corner Inlet, around, this is just stunning flying around, Wilson's Promontory National Park. Someone did mention in the comments that I incorrectly identified the southernmost point of Victoria. I think I had it as Wilson's Promontory Light Station. This is what I showed on screen saying Australia's southernmost point. It's not. The southernmost point is actually here. I think this is South Point. Yeah. So thanks for pointing out my stupid mistakes in the comments. I always really like it when you do that. Up through Wilson's Promontory around the base here. Back around the heads. Of course, I've talked about this big circle. Back into Morabin Airport. And this was the point right here. Uh, where is it? Between Reckless Lane and Black Knight Street, where the two paths crossed over and I completed that loop of Victoria. Now, if you zoom out, it actually looks pretty good. I'm quite happy with, with how that all looks. Of course, there are things that I would have liked to have done better, but at the end of the day, you can always improve. I think that's kind of the moral of the story here. Now, a few questions then you wanted to ask about um, fuel usage and cost. So let's go through some of those. How much fuel did you burn? Mildura was 216 liters. That was $472 worth of fuel. God, flying's not cheap, is it? Echuca was 77 liters. That's $159 of fuel. Bairnsdale was 171 liters. And I haven't finally got the cost for Morabin, but I've got the amount. So it was 133 liters. Total would be $1,294.47. For me, I'll be honest with the accommodation, with the other expenses on top, I would say that this whole trip probably would have cost in the region of around 2,000 Australian dollars. So exactly how accurately did I fly the border? Two ways to work this out. One is your opinion. I personally think B+. The second way and slightly more scientific way of doing it is by taking the entire distance of the coastline, the entire distance that I flew and working out one as a percentage of the other. So we can do that. The entire distance around the coastline of Victoria is 5,053 kilometers. I flew three legs of 600 nautical miles, 653 nautical miles and 335 nautical miles. That's 1,588 nautical miles. Convert that to kilometers, that's 2,941 kilometers. So 2941 as a percentage of 5053, that's 58%. Now aviation exams, the pass mark is normally 70, so 58%. That's a solid fail. But at the end of the day, the experience was brilliant. I really enjoyed doing it. I loved sharing it with you as well here on YouTube. And I loved getting all your feedback and questions on the trip. So thank you very much if you did submit a question. If you have any others, let me know in the comments below. I'll be online for the first few hours of this video going live. I'll do my best to answer them. Otherwise, what's next? I'm not doing the coastline of Australia. I'm just putting it out there now. It's not happening. <laughs>